want to invite the next speaker on board. She's my good friend, Olivia Mitchell. Uh, Olivia is the International Foundation of Employee Benefit Plan Professor at the Wharton School. She's also a Professor of Insurance and Risk Management and uh, Business Economic and Policy. She's an Executive Director of Pension Research Council and Director of Wharton Centre for Pension and Retirement Research at Wharton School. She's currently a Research Associate at NDR and the Director of Wells Fargo. In SMU, uh, she is very instrumental in helping us set up the CSS, Centre for Civil Security, and she is a Senior Research Fellow at the Centre. Uh, she will speak on ADLs and Nursing Home Admittance. Let's welcome all of you. Singapore, I'm especially delighted that there's no haze. <laughs> I was a bit worried on the way in the door when I uh, looked at the internet last week, but uh, fortunately we're in good shape this week. So um, by way of uh, introduction, let me just thank um, SMU and the Sim Kee-Boon Institute, and in particular, uh, Dr. Benedict Ko and the Set Center for Silver Security that has been sponsoring these annual conferences now for six years, um, and I hope for many more, more years to come. The topic that I will discuss follows very naturally from what Mike Kern talked about, namely uh, some of the factors that precipitate frailty in old age, some of the ways of uh, measuring uh, limitations of activities of daily living, our focus in the paper that we're working on is a bit more insurance related because that's my background. Uh, what we're interested in ultimately is looking at the kinds of factors that influence the demand and the supply for long-term care insurance in countries which have or which need a market in that space. So that's really the focus where I will be uh, moving to. So let me uh, just give you a bit of background. What we see here is that in the US, and this is US data I will be talking about today, I hope, by the way, that in years to come, we can do the similar sort of research in Singapore with longitudinal data, because that's very much what you need to be able to track people through time, as uh, Dr. Hurd mentioned. But what we see here, is that the share of the elderly population is rising. So in 2010, if you look at the fraction age 65 to 74, it's about 9%, about 6% in that middle group, 75 to 84, and only about 2.3% in the 85 plus. But as you look through time, 2030 and 2050, the fraction of people moving up, especially into the 85 age group, is increasing substantially. And as we saw from the previous uh, set of presentations, the 85 plus group is the group that's most likely to be in need for some sort of care. The one thing I will say, speaking as a baby boomer, and I think many of you know what that means, it means you were born between 1946 and 1964. I see a few members of my generation. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that you don't realize when you're younger than that, and I'm increasingly beginning to realize it, is that the so-called elderly or older population is very heterogeneous. It's very, very diverse. And when you're 20 year old, years old, I think they say if you're 20, don't trust anyone over 40. But when you start to get a little bit older, what you realize is there's a much more diverse group of population in the 65 plus age category. And the needs and the interests and the requirements change dramatically with age. What we see in the US is that the rate of institutionalization, that is people who need care, age care homes, changes dramatically in the 65 to 74 age range. It's a, a percent, percent, 1.3 percent. And if you look at the 85 plus age range, you see nine, over 9 percent of the folks are in nursing home care currently, and about 4 percent are in, or 5 percent 
are in some kind of residential care facility, perhaps not requiring quite as much in the way of uh, detailed medical care, but needing help, for example, with some of the ADLs we're going to be talking about. And then today, if you look at the entire population, 65 plus, it's a relatively small number, but it will be growing, as we know, as longevity extends and more and more people live longer. So let me talk a little bit about the challenges that we face, and I think in many ways are quite similar to what Singapore's looking forward to. Right now, we have about 3.3 million Americans in about 16,000 nursing homes, about one of seven people over age 65, and more than one in five of the 85 plus are in nursing homes. 20% uh, of today's 65 year olds, it's estimated, may need nursing home care at least five years, more than five years. And this gets to be very expensive uh, if you start to look at the numbers, which I'll show in a second. On average, it's estimated today, women tend to require care longer, 3.7 years in a nursing home, compared to men. Now, why is that? Well, fortunately or unfortunately, men don't live as long. So they don't have as much exposure to remaining in the nursing home. Uh, also, what we know is across the world, in many countries, women tend to marry men older than they are. And women tend to provide more of the care to their husbands when they become frail. So as a consequence, men are less likely to go into the nursing home, particularly if they're married, and they're less likely to stay there very long. This becomes very important. If you look at the typical cost of nursing home care now, they're averaging about $100,000 a year, uh, which I think is a number that begins to make people grow weak at the knees when they start to think about staying there for five years or possibly longer. So this is the, the, the context in which we're looking at this problem. So what prompts nursing home entry? That's really the question that we're looking at. Um, first of all, poor health. And as Michael mentioned, both mental and physical is driving this. We also uh, are looking at the same kinds of criteria, the activities of daily living limitations or failures. And um, this is the same list that's been used in practically every country that's tracking limitations in uh, activities of daily living by age, eating, bathing, dressing, toileting, transferring, and walking, and continence. In the US, we have more or less a two-tier system of paying for institutional care. So first of all, the government is a big provider of care. Medicaid is a, a national system with state subsidies and, and state administered. It pays about 35% of elderly expenditures for long-term care, for nursing home care. It's about 76 billion, and it's growing rapidly, eight to nine percent a year. Now, the, one of the important things about Medicaid is that it is means-tested. It's income tested as well as asset tested. And there's some variation state by state. In fact, I've started talking to older people lately who are strategically planning to move to states where the Medicaid coverage is more generous and maybe some of the asset tests are less rigorous. But, so what we see is a very across state, it's on the order of around $2,000 worth of income a month and about $5,000 in assets. Important to note, in the US, typically they exclude your home from the asset calculation. That's not true in every country. And obviously, one of the concerns is that if your home is excluded from your asset test, the incentive is to put all your wealth in your home, because that won't be counted when time comes to be uh, deemed in need of care. Now, again, the state plays a big role. We have 50 states in the US, and so there's differential patterns across states. The state will assess the enrollee's medication needs, nursing needs, the medical and physical impairments, and decide the ADLs and the instrumental, the more high-level activities of daily living 
to determine whether an individual needs care and how much care he or she needs. And the trigger under Medicaid is typically a three plus ADL standard. And as far as I know, and we can talk about this during the discussion, that's also the trigger for Elder Shield in Singapore. So it's a common trigger. Cognitively impaired would also be a trigger as well in the US case. In addition, we have a national health insurance scheme for the elderly, which is deemed 65 plus. I, I, as I start to go get closer to this <laughs> magic number, you know, we need a new title for this. But anyway. <laughs> Medicare does cover some nursing home provision, but usually only if you've first been through a hospital stay. So for example, if you've fallen, broken your hip, very common among older people, and you need surgery, then Medicare might pay for the, the recuperation period and the rehabilitation period. But only if you've been in the hospital and typically limited to 90 days. So it's not going to be the primary source of long-term care for people that need to go in for years and years. In the US, we also have a small, private nursing home insurance market. And uh, I say it's small because only about 13% of the 50 plus have it. The trigger there is a little bit more generous. You only need two plus ADLs um, if, you, if the doctor attests to the fact that you're gonna have them for 90 days or more. And so one reason people might purchase private long-term care insurance is that they'd like to protect their assets and their income from the need to draw it down to then become eligible for the first tier uh, system. So it, against this context, what we're doing is looking at um, ADLs and to see how they're used and to see what the pattern of ADL onset is in order to ask the question ultimately, which trigger seems to be more protective? Which triggers seem to be more expensive to cover? And as we see in many countries, these triggers are also determined, are used to determine whether you need subsidized care. So the paper that we talk about examines, like Michael did, trends in functional disability with age, the proportion meeting two or three ADL triggers, when people suffer from the disability, and also what kinds of disabilities seem most likely to trigger nursing home admittance. So currently, most of the insurance policies, be they government or private, simply sum up the number of ADLs that you might have. And if you hit the two or the three threshold, then they declare you eligible. But what we're interested in addition is to look at the disaggregated types of ADLs to see whether some seem more likely to cast you into the need category than others, or which ones put you in there first. So the HRS has already been discussed, the health and retirement study by Michael. What we do is take 22,000 adults uh, age 50 plus, and in particular, we're looking at the waves from 1993 to 2010, and we've pooled five different birth cohorts for about 28,000 individuals. And as Michael mentioned, this is kind of the standard category. It is self-reported, as was noted. Please tell me if you have any difficulty with these because of a physical, mental, emotional, or memory problem. Exclude any you expect that last less than three months, and then there's a list. Do you have difficulty with any of these from the list that we've studied? So what do we get when we plot these by age? And we're also focusing on sex differences as well. So the first thing we see is that if you look at younger people, 50 to 59, even through 60 or 69, the rates, blue is for boys, pink is for girls, just to keep it straight, of course. And um, so male all and female all refer to the the question, do you have any disability at that age, counting people both in the community and people who are institutionalized. The other group, the dotted lines, refer to people only who are in the community, so that we exclude folks that have already been institutionalized. 
Now what we also see is after you get to be around in your late 80s and especially in your early 90s, there's a big increase in the level of two or more ADLs with age. So that's the first thing. Typically, you know, it's not that everybody's super healthy up until their mid-80s, but they're not likely to have enough disability to need nursing home care prior to that age. Now, the second thing that's obvious is that um, women tend to have higher levels of disability than men. So, is that right? No. <laughs> women are more likely to have ADLs, women are the pink. So their overall levels of ADLs are higher than the blue for the men. And all the way up, up until the very oldest ages, when the few remaining men tend to be fairly disabled. Um, what's interesting to me is that even at age 95 or so, still the, pr the prevalence of having disabilities in the population is less than 50%. And so this may influence the way you see the probability of frailty at older ages. Now, this is the probability of two plus ADLs. And as you see, it's very large at the oldest ages. Below age 80 or 85, not much. This summarizes what I just showed you. After 80, prevalence begins to diverge by sex. And in particular, in the 85 to 89 age group, Women are about 30% likely to have two or more ADLs. Men, about 22%. Of course, men have shorter life expectancy. Life tables show that the 75-year-old males live to 86 on average, and they're very unlikely to have a large number of ADLs. So what we take from this is at least using current data, right, and that's what we have for now, the average older male in the US can likely spend most of his retirement years without worrying too much about having a large number of ADL. Not so much the case for women. Let's look at the differences for the three plus ADLs. Again, blue is for boys, pink is for girls. And what we see is that obviously people in the community have much lower rates of ADLs than the population as a whole, again, at age 90 or so, the rates are still below 50%. And it's not surprising because it's a higher threshold. It's a higher bar to have the three ADLs. But interestingly, women are more likely to have the three plus ADLs than men up to about age 95. At that point, there's a crossover. So what do we make of that? Here we go. We make of that the fact that the people most likely to experience a large number of ADLs are much more likely to be women at older ages. So um, the fraction of people age 84 who are estimated to need long-term care facilities is about 15 to 19% under the two plus criterion, about nine to 13 under the three plus criterion. So then what we undertake is a little bit more uh, multivariate analysis, where we're interested in three separate outcomes. We're interested in um, the probability of being admitted to nursing home as a function of having one or more, two or more, or three or more ADL disabilities. And we have a host of controls on other variables, like race and sex and health characteristics. Do you have nursing home insurance? and chronic diseases as well. What do we find? First of all, and this confirms what we showed in the simple graphs, women have, are significantly more likely to have any number of ADLs compared to men. So while elderly women are more likely than men to experience fewer ADL disabilities, they're more prone to have severe disabilities. And age, of course, is significant for all outcomes. Is consistent with all the prior studies and with the work that Michael showed. One of the things we found that was puzzling was that there are differences in cohort. And we would not have seen this if we had not been able to look at several different cohorts with this longitudinal data. Interestingly, the older cohorts, people born longer ago, were less 
likely to report suffering ADL disabilities than the more recent cohort that was introduced uh, in the early 90s. And we don't quite know why that's true. One of the things that we have found in other work is the HRS population is much more likely to report more depression, more pain, more physical limitations. And we surmised in that other research that the more recent generation may simply find that it's socially acceptable to report more depression. Now there's medication for it. More pain, now there's medication for it. And so it may be that rather than the fact that they're really suffering more recently. On the other hand, it could be a result of the obesity situation as well. And especially among women, women in that cohort were more likely to smoke. So conditioning um, these predicted probabilities and combining them with population mortality, what we've been able to estimate is what's the probability that you will have one or more ADLs or two or more ADLs conditional on living to age 100. And so what we estimate is that 866 out of 1,000 men and 930 of 1,000 women will develop at least one ADL uh, before age 100. So one may not be so concerning, but the more you look at, the more expensive it gets. Still 736 out of 1,000 men and 858 of 1,000 women will develop two or more. And in the bottom table, what we have, oops, come back here, is uh, the fact that three or more, 612 out of 1,000 men and 767 of 1,000 women will develop three or more. So this is a substantial risk in our view, and it's a substantial potential catastrophic impact on your household budget if you do need to go into the nursing home. Okay, here we go. So we then take a competing risk framework what, where we look at the risk of moving from the community. You could stay there, you could be in a nursing home, or you may perish in the next period. So again, what we're trying to estimate is what's the probability that people transited across these different states? By 2010, 61% remained in the community, 32 died, 7% had transit, transited to a nursing home. And if we ask the question, what's the, what are the factors that drive the uh, risk of nursing home entry, very clearly what you see is, first of all, age. If you are a year older, that raises your hazard ratio by 29%. If you have one ADL versus the reference category of zero, you're more than twice as likely to end up in the nursing home. But having two, is obviously even more substantial. And so that's uh, using uh, the number of ADLs compared to zero. Now, those with five or six ADLs, interestingly, um, have relatively high proportions. So once you get to three, four, you know, at that point, the additional risk is not that great above having two or more. So the way we interpret it is the following. If you use a threshold for being eligible for long-term care coverage or benefit of three or more ADLs, this is a very stringent break, uh, threshold. That is, a lot of people are gonna get to the two or more threshold, far fewer people will get to the three or more. And in fact, under the three or more criteria, individuals having three or more restrictions are almost as prone to be admitted to a residential faculty as are the people with more than three. And the other related point that we wanted to look at was the type of ADL you have. So here we disaggregate what's the probability moving from the community into the nursing home or into the other two uh, transition uh, probabilities as well. But let me note that inability to dress yourself has no significant effect. That is, that's an ADL, yes, but it doesn't seem to precipitate um, needing to move into the nursing home. Walking is important, but quantitatively the most critical one seems to be ability to bathe yourself. 
And this is true in pretty much every one of the different studies we looked at. It, it's also predictive, obviously, of dying as well. And eating is significant, but not nearly as important as the bathing outcome. So what do we make of that? What we think is that if you have this bathing ADL, you're 82% more likely to be in a nursing home. And why is it that that might be the case? Well, obviously bathing is a very personal, a very private sort of thing. And people struggle to be able to avoid nursing homes in many cases. But once you can't bathe yourself, then it basically everything else falls apart. People who need help bathing are much more likely to be in nursing homes to get that care. It's also obviously a strong predictor of mortality, both among community dwellers and nursing home residents. The walking and eating are important, about a 25% higher risk of, of nursing home entry. And the rest of them, surprising to me, because I have a 90-year-old mother, are much less predictive of nursing home entry. And I have to say, as a child of an elderly parent, these things bothered me a lot more, perhaps because I didn't see what was happening with the bathing issues and saw much more the, the superficial issues. So interpretations, what we see is that below 80, men and women look about the same. Above 80, women do require more nursing home resources. They live longer, they're more likely to have the limitations. And the impact of aging boosts the probability of being fun functionally disabled by 12% for women, but only 9% for men. So what we know in this aging society is first of all, women live longer. <laughs> women are more likely to have additional activities of daily living restriction, which means women are more likely to need the nursing home care in the long run. <laughs> you use, and this is our early surmise here, if you were to use in nursing home policies a three plus ADL criteria, as is used in Singapore, then what you would see at, is that the outcomes would be more similar by sex, and the nursing home costs would be spread more similarly across men and women in the population. If you set the criterion at two plus, then in a world where you are allowed to price discriminate based on sex, women would be more expensive to insure than men. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's the way insurance is priced. But it says that this recognizes the actual risk to the insurer. On the other hand, if you set the pricing using three plus ADLs as the criterion, there would be no compelling grounds or need for underwriting based on sex. So let me quickly summarize, and then we'll have some time for questions. What we think we are trying to do in this paper is use longitudinal panel data in the Health and Retirement Study to follow people, the same people, through time to see what happens to their frailty and their nursing home use over their years. I think we have some more generalizable empirical results than past studies. And also, the disaggregation of ADL seems to be very interesting and worth pursuing further. Ultimately, what we're focusing on then is trying to predict future costs and challenges for an aging society. And this is an instrument to that outcome. Let me just finish with uh, a picture I saw when I was visiting Japan in the spring. This is the question, the answer to the question, are we our children's future burdens? And this is uh, a picture that perhaps will become more prevalent, I hope not, in years to come. So a couple of uh, advertisements. What we have here is some books that we've written on the global uh, financial crisis and retirement, and a topic I hope of much interest to many of you, financial literacy uh, in preparing for retirement. So with that, I'll stop and take any questions. Professor Mitchell, I wanted to ask a question. I know that this, this particular paper is targeting the insurance and, um, yeah. But I was just wondering whether in your regressions, whether you could anything on the presence of a caregiver. I mean, it could also delay nursing home admission. Like you said, like your mom, she's 90 years old and caregivers. So um, yeah, thanks. 
So that's a hard question because obviously if there are caregivers present, and I understand that's something that's more common in Singapore, for example, than in the US, then you might not need to go to nursing homes. Uh, and there is a tremendous amount of home health care given in most, in most countries around the world. We didn't control on it because it's endogenous. That is, uh, if you are thinking about some things which arguably could be more objective, the presence of these physical limitations, then one path might be to stay in the community with a home health care giver. Another might be to go to a nursing home. But since the nursing homes in the US are so heavily publicly subsidized, then the cost consequences and the consequences for fiscal budgets and taxes are very, very different if you hire the, the caregiver yourself, then presumably the family pays for it. So it's an interesting question, and we could add that as another one of the transition outcomes. Do you go to a nursing home, or do you go, for example, stay in your home and have care provided? So that would be an extension of the model. Okay, so what's your thought on, uh, this is actually a policy <laughs> question, uh, that um, given our culture, that uh, nursing home is not such a good idea, but staying at home, would be a better option. And um, this alludes to the last speaker, uh, Rutan Village would be a better option. But having said that, um, insurance uh, costs is escalating. So when you bring a person back home, there's always this cost, like you know, uh, home care and things like that. So at the end of the day, for uh, Singapore's context, would you think that uh, the home-based one would be more relevant than this in, home in the future. Thanks. Thank you for your question. <coughs> I think that um, every country is struggling with the question of what's the filial responsibility? What's the responsibility of the government? What's the responsibility of the private sector in providing um, insurance? The situation in Singapore, as I understand it, and I'm not a permanent resident, so I hope maybe someday I might be, um, is that it's possible to hire help to help take care of, of the elderly person. Now, depending on your housing situation, then maybe that's feasible, maybe it's not. Right? Um, in my own experience, I've seen situations where, particularly as people become afflicted with dementia, then it's very difficult to keep such a person in your home, even with help. Um, there's a phenomenon known as, uh, which some of you will know, known as sundowning. So what happens every day at sundown is the older person just becomes extremely irascible and, and starts to try to run away. And, you, know, you may be able to handle that in your home, but it becomes very, very difficult at a point. So it depends on the specific limitations that you're dealing with. Obviously, your, the, the available space you have and whether you can afford to hire help. In the US, it's extremely expensive to hire help. So that's not much of an option for most of us. Professor, uh, I think in, in uh, many countries now, the, the discussion is about moving care out of, of institutional walls in the community. In fact, uh -huh. the Indian Foundation, KPMG, which is where I'm from, came out to study and thought about new models of care. So I'm thinking in, in terms of future research, other than the limiting it to within nursing homes and the cutoff points and all that, how do we assess the different services that are coming out, the home based being one, and there are a whole range of services that can be delivered, delivered at home, uh, or the PACE model, the day care center, you go in and you come home to, mm -hmm. to stay. So if there are so many segments uh, or, or, or offerings which are going to come out, how do you think future research should address that? You know, because it's not going to be a dichotomous in or out of nursing homes. I think you're absolutely right. The thing that I've seen develop in the U.S., and I think we'll hear about this later from one of our colleagues, is the graduated residential approach, where you might move in when you're, I don't know, 70, perhaps. Typically, you have to be in pretty good shape to move into one of these communities. They don't want people who are already in, in, in dire need. But you typically will move into one of these uh, graduated communities. Maybe you'll live independently, but there could be a dining room, so you don't have to cook and shop and do your dishes and so on. But maybe there's group activities and, you know, so you're independent, but you're under surveillance, if you will. Um, and I think, by the way, some of the new uh, technology and the robotics 
are making that much more feasible so that their motion sensors inside the apartments and if there's no motion detected, they send somebody to look for you and make sure you're not on the floor with a broken hip. Um, so there's, there is some substitution of capital for labor, if you will, and I think that's helpful in that it allows people to maintain a sense of independence because there's nothing more discouraging, I believe, than being told when to eat and when to shower and when to walk and when to sit and when to go to your, you know, your activities. Um, but those things are gonna take a lot of research, to be honest, and I hope that Singapore actually could be at the forefront of beginning to work on these technological enhancements to life. So for example, there's situations now in Japan I was reading about where you can have your blood pressure taken, you just have a little cuff, and it sends the results directly to the doctor who then can monitor whether you need to come in or not. Um, I, I don't think it will make anybody too uncomfortable, but also, um, you know, there's this uh, toilet company called Toto, and they walk and talk and sing, and they do everything for you. <laughs> but now they can actually measure your urinary output, decide whether you have sugar in your urine, and determine whether you have uh, your diabetes under control or not. So, I mean, these things are not beyond the pale. This is the kind of thing we all should be looking at to try to enhance, I think, staying home, which will be a lot cheaper and probably a lot more pleasurable. But to be quite honest, you know, once you can't bathe, you can't walk, you can't eat, you're going to need help. And it's going to take human intervention some way or somehow. And that's, I think, the forefront that you're at and that we are at as well.